All right, welcome everybody uh, to the show called Midsummer Marauders. This is put on by MC Iris uh, to talk about the identification and control of summer invasive plants. Um, we are gonna cover six different plants I'll go over in a minute. There'll be time at the end. If you've got other species that you wanna talk about, that's great. If you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box. And I wanna thank uh, Amy Thompson, a uh, Purdue Extension educator who is here as, as helping me so that she can track the chat. If you have a problem hearing or uh, issues that you need help with, please put those in the chat box and any questions then we'll deal with as, as we go. So thank you everybody for attending. I'm gonna share my screen now for Midsummer Marauders. And let's talk first about what is MC Iris? Monroe County Identify and Reduce Invasive Species. We're a group that started 11 years ago. And we're a coalition of Monroe County citizens aimed at reducing the environmental and economic impact of invasive species in our county through education and action. And Specific ways that we do that include educational programs like this one. We've already done our, our winter invasives talk, our spring invasives talk. This is the third in the series. This is the summer invasives uh, identification and control. All of these talks end up on our YouTube channel with a lot of other uh, useful information uh, videos on uh, invasive plant species. So uh, this link is also on our website, which is at the bottom of the page, mc-iris.org. If you go there, you're gonna find all this information, basically everything that I'm gonna talk about tonight. You're gonna find resources like the calendar of control, uh, which gives you the specific information on how and when to control every invasive species. I'm gonna actually show you that tonight. I'm gonna to go to our website so I can share that with you. We loan toolkits to Monroe County residents. That includes uh, hand saws, pruners, loppers. It includes even a weed wrench for pulling weed shrubs, invasive shrubs out of the ground. And that's eight different toolkits scattered around the county. You can look for those on our website and sign one out if you want that uh, to use. And we give free invasive surveys to residents in Monroe County. We'll come to your land and we'll list for you what your invasives are, what natives you have, and give you advice on how to manage what you have on your land. All right. So I'm going to interrupt talk you about are all herbaceous. Gonna... Yes. Sorry. Go ahead, I think Amy. you might. I think you might have a setting going where you're the only one who can see the chat. I cannot see the chat and oh, I cannot okay. see anybody but you, but maybe I'm the only one that's having that issue. Uh, let's see, would that be under security? It says that participants should be able to chat. And I'm, I'm having the same problem. This is Barbara. I can see the chat by just going way down with my arrow to the bottom of the screen. Yes, but when I pull it up, the only person I can chat with is Ellen. Just yeah. if people had questions, but we're such a small group, it probably doesn't matter, Ellen. If folks okay. Can... Thank you for letting me know. Probably the best yeah. thing is if you have a question, feel free to interrupt me at any point. Just take yourself off mute and uh, you can ask your question, or if you wanna hold it till the end, that is fine too. Uh, thanks for letting me know that, Amy. That is somewhere in the settings here, and there's no way I can find it. Uh, nope. So we'll just continue on, but thank you. <laughs> All right. So the six species are all herbaceous species. In the winter talk, we focused a lot on the woody species because herbaceous plants, the leaves aren't green in the winter, right? Now the leaves are green. So this is the time where we're really looking at herbaceous plants and how to control them. And the six are Japanese stiltgrass, poison hemlock, wild parsnip, Canada thistle, crown vetch, and Japanese knotweed. And there's something you need to know about 
the invasive plants you control, one of the first things to know is what, what is the life habit of that species. You need to know that Japanese silkgrass is an annual and poison hemlock and wild parsnip are biennials and Canada thistle crown vetch and Japanese knotweed are perennials. Now why that matters is because if you're an annual or a biennial, you put all your energy into making lots and lots of seeds and your roots are sad little tiny roots, barely enough to survive all energy to the seeds. Whereas perennials tend to put a lot of energy into their roots, big root system. Often, sometimes at least they have rhizomes, which are not roots, but are underground uh, horizontal stems uh, that interact with the roots. Um, and the amount of seed that the perennials put out varies a lot. They're not as concerned about seed, they're concerned about just surviving and keeping a good root system so that they can bring in lots of water and nutrients. And what that means in terms of uh, control is that for annuals and biannuals, pulling is a possible control method if you have small amounts. And we'll talk specifics about what that means. But when you get to perennials, unless you dig them out, chemical control is a method that reliably works. And I am going to take you now to some information on our website that will, if this all works. Okay, this is the website that I'm gonna keep pushing you to, mcsi.org. On it, if you go to invasive plant species, you have a drop down of all the different invasives. Click on those, you'll get a lot more information. We've got different projects we're doing. I'll be talking about the Reduce One Invasive Species Challenge in a bit, and we've got resources. Um, we've got where to sign up for an invasive plant survey, like I mentioned. We've got information for landowners. The top of it, we've got some of the financial so resources available to help with invasive control uh, in Monroe County. And then we have some specific control guidance. One is the herbicide safety sheet. So since we're gonna talk about chemicals, I just wanna bring this up and show it to you. Um, this is something we give out with the toolkit loan. We give you a Ziploc bag to keep with funnels, safety glasses, rubber gloves, um, and herbicide applicators. No herbicide in it, but you also get this sheet so that you know how to use herbicides safely. Uh, the safety information is here, how to clean up and dispose of herbicides. On the back side is a really useful resource for mixing herbicides. Because tonight I'm gonna be talking about, you're gonna wanna use 3% glyphosate. Well, how do you mix 3%? You use four ounces of the herbicide in one gallon of water, full strength herbicide. Um, so conversions, definitions. So this is a useful piece of information um, to, to read before you start using herbicides. The other thing is the calendar of control that I already mentioned, uh, something that we have been using a lot and landowners seem to find useful. It's a lot of introductory information, uh, cautions about using uh, herbicides, uh, when it can be appro appropriate to use hand pulling and other non-chemical control methods. But when you get into the heart of it, what it does is it lists by category, shrubs, vines, trees, and so on, the different invasive species. And then it's got a calendar and it tells you when and what methods to use. So for these invasive shrubs, what it says is in this orange box is foliar spray from May until September. If you go down to the bottom of the sheet, orange means it's a foliar spray with 3% glyphosate and 1.5% non-ionic surfactant. Importantly, all the methods we're gonna talk about tonight for these six species require a surfactant because you're applying chemical to leaves. And a surfactant is a soapy solution you add to herbicide that allows that herbicide to cling onto leaves, makes it more effective. On the back of this sheet are some species we're gonna talk about tonight, like Canada thistle, um, Japanese knotweed, crown vetch, uh, and each of these has the different the times when it's best to use and what's uh, chemical to use. And if you go to the bottom of this sheet, some other really crucial information for herbicide use is 
When I say glyphosate, that's the active ingredient. When you go to the store, they're not selling glyphosate. They're selling it under a trade name. So here are the trade names you can buy glyphosate as. That was Roundup, which was the first one. But now there's Glypro Plus, Glystar Plus, Ranger Pro, Razor Pro. And in blue, this is important, if you are on or near water, you may only use herbicides that are safe to use on or near water, aquatic labeling. Those in blue on this sheet are the aquatic safe herbicides to use. So there is glyphosate that's safe for aquatic, but that's Rodeo, Aquanite, or Catplex. There's also Imazapir. Both of these are e examples of non-selective herbicides, meaning any green that they touch, they will kill. We also have selective herbicides. I'm going to talk about a few of these. Um, and this, set, this list will tell you which species, what it is sold, which active ingredient, what it is sold as, and then what does it kill? Like triclopyrs only kill broadleaf plants, not grasses. Whereas cethoxidim, sold as post, kills only grass, not the broad leaves. So you can be more specific in the chemical you choose. And then finally at the bottom we have, here are specific names of non-ionic surfactants to add to your herbicide. And there in blue are the aquatic safe ones. And the names of oils that you can use. In one case, we're gonna talk about one where you need to use an oil as your surfactant. And then dyes. Dyes are always a good idea. So you know what you've sprayed and what you haven't. And if you inadvertently got any on you, any of the herbicide on you, so you can wash well. So that Ellen, is, yeah. Hi, Mary. I just wanted, hi, I just tuning in. I just wanted to interrupt because I would love to get your take because I get this question a lot. Can I use Dawn dish soap as for surfactant? Can I use food coloring as dye? And why is it not a good idea? Thank you, Mary. Great question. Um, in general, I would say no. It's not a good idea to use something that was created for use in food as an herbicide additive. Um, one reason, just being very practical, it's way more expensive. Um, and it's not really designed. Like if you use food coloring to color your herbicide, it will take a lot more than something that is sold for that purpose. One or two drops is all you need. With food coloring, it would take a lot more. And food coloring is a lot more expensive because it's made to be ingested and the herbicide dye isn't. And similarly, Dawn dishwashing soap is not intended to work in um, herbicide mixes. It's really best to get the right, um, for the right chemicals to use when you're doing herbicide, because you really don't want to go to all the work and trouble of doing herbicide and then find out, well, you didn't add enough Dawn dishwashing soap because there's no label on Dawn dishwashing soap that tells you how much to add. So you could inadvertently add too little or add too much. When you buy a surfactant, it tells you exactly how much to add so that you know you have a much better chance of being effective. Does that answer the question, Mary? Yes, thank you. You bet. All right, I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint show now. Um, and just a final reminder that, because these are all foliar spray treatments on leaves, you need to have, make sure a surfactant is in the mix. In some cases, they will already have a surfactant in the herbicide. You have to read the label of the herbicide to see whether that is the case. Most of the time they don't um, and you have to add it separately. Okay, so let's start with our first species. And this is the one we'll probably spend a lot of time talking about because this is one of the worst scourges in Monroe County. Um, what we have here is an annual grass and it can grow one to three feet tall. In reality, I've seen it almost five feet tall if it's getting plenty of water and light. It was introduced accidentally in Tennessee because the other name for the species is packing grass. It was used to pack porcelain coming over from Asia. And someone in Knoxville, Tennessee 
in the early 20th century, pulled that packing material, tossed it in his or her backyard, and it took root. Uh, and there were seeds in it so that this annual grass started coming up. And since then, it has been moving north quickly. Um, it moves into uh, disturbed areas, but most concerningly, it can also move into largely undisturbed forests because it's very shade tolerant. And then it can dominate the forest interior like this picture shows in the upper left, that's complete Japanese stilt grass. And I'm gonna show you a picture in a minute from Monroe County that essentially is like that. And it's mostly in the southern half of the state. There are scattered populations in the north, but it started in Tennessee and it's moving its way north. Came into Indiana in Harrison County um, probably 30 years ago at this point and just continues to move north. Its flowers are nothing to write home about. That's this lower right picture. There's the leaf. This is a flowering stem and those flowers then produce seeds. Each plant can produce 100 to 1,000 seeds and they have viability of for five or more years. The leaves are how you're going to really identify this species. Um, they have, on this picture on the left, it shows you can see there's sort of a uh, shiny white stripe uh, down the close to the center. And if you look very closely at the midrib, you'll see it's actually off center. It's not dead center. Those are two characters to use to identify this one. This is important. This is a prostrate plant. When it first starts growing, it's growing upright. And then those stems just fall over. And every node where a leaf is coming out will root. And then a new shoot will come out from that node. And so a single seed, tiny seed, can result in a patch, you know, easily 10, 20 square feet one plant because it just keeps sprawling out and growing. There are a couple of grasses that are native that look similar. White grass is one of those, Lyrzia virginica, but it doesn't have that stripe that you see here. Um, it's, it's just a flat with, with no stripe. Uh, it has hairy nodes, whereas the nodes are smooth in Japanese stilt grass. And to my eye, the, the leaves of white grass are longer and narrower, whereas stilt grass has shorter and broader leaves, which is what makes it stand out to me. So when you're controlling a Japanese stilt grass, timing is everything. So first, learn the life cycle of Japanese stilt grass. It starts germinating in mid-March continues that germination in April. And I would argue there are not many, but there are still some seeds that are germinating in May and even June. So they continue to come up from the seed bank and grow. They grow through June, they grow through July, they grow and near the end of August, they put out that little flowering stem. By early September, the seeds are starting to ripen. Now, what does this mean? because this is an annual, your whole goal is to stop it from having seeds ripen. It means your control period is before um, the middle of September. And we're right in the heart of Japanese stiltgrass control season right now. So when you look below the, the months, these are different ways of control and when they are usually uh, engaged in. Pre-emergent herbicides are herbicides you put down on the ground and they stop the germination of seeds or greatly reduce the germination of seeds. Uh, there are also pre-emergent and post-emergent herbicides you can use early in the season before many plants have really come up. But most people are controlling Japanese stilt grass starting in June and well into August using either glyphosate or grass-specific herbicides. And we're gonna talk specifically about each of these. You can also use some hand pulling and string trimming it's, um, if you have small amounts, um, but by the time it's starting to have seeds on it in September, if you're hand pulling, you need to carefully bag everything. You don't wanna string trim at that point because you are just gonna be flinging 
the ripe seeds everywhere. Okay, so the big question to ask when you cho choose which method you're gonna use is how much do you have? It's important to scout out so you know the full extent of what you're dealing with. If it's a hundred plants, you're gonna have one solution. If you have a hundred thousand, you're going to have a different solution. If you have a small infestation, and there are many places in the county where it's still just starting, and there really are just a hundred plants or less, or less, pull them. If you pull before they start seed production in September, you can pull and just pile them on the ground where they, they don't have any chance of rooting, you know, put them on a stump or something like that. Um, but once they do start producing seeds, you are gonna want to bag them when you pull them. Um, small infestation to me means it's small enough that you have the time to actually go through and pull a couple of times all the plants because often you're going to miss some the first time through and you need to go through again. There are also people who have tried cardboard and mulch. You know, if you've got a small area and it's nice and flat, there's no stumps, there's no rocks, and you can get cardboard flat on the ground and then pile mulch on top, you will be able to smother the Japanese stilt grass. If there were any native plants under that cardboard, of course, you're gonna kill all of them too. And one of, the, one of the themes of controlling stilt grass is you're trying to do it as selectively as possible because your biggest hope is that the native plants that are there are going to fill in the blank space that you leave from the stilt grass. You don't want blank space because that's what stilt grass loves. So you, you may be able to kill the stilt grass, but you're gonna kill the, with, with cardboard, you're gonna kill other species um, and you're gonna have a big blank area when you're finished. So it, it would not be my favorite method for dealing with stilt grass. <clears throat> if you have larger infestations, many of us do, chemical treatment is generally what's uh, the, the, the method to use. And that timing is June, July, and August. It does take a surfactant. And three different options I have listed here. There's the 0.5% glyphosate. This was recommended on the calendar of control. Now that's a pretty dilute solution of glyphosate. It probably will affect other plants because it's broad spectrum. So it will kill you know, the violets that are next to the stilt grass or anything else growing there. It does take effect fairly quickly. Within a week, you should see damage. So you can tell if you missed anything. Grass-specific herbicides, one active ingredient for those is clethodim, another is cethoxidim, are like magic in some ways. The first time I used, I was using cethoxidim and I sprayed it over this area, a couple square meter, and there was Japanese stilt grass scattered through it, but there were ferns, there were sedges, there was white grass, there was violets, there was, um, uh, white avens, there's just a bunch of stuff. And I sprayed that grass specific herbicide at 0.5% over it. And a month later, all that had been harmed was the stilt grass. It was dead, it was gone, everything else was intact. It seemed like magic. And in a, in a way, it, it really is a great solution. But there's a couple of downsides that I have to be honest with you about. It takes two to four weeks for you to see any impact. And that means, well, if you're in June, that's fine. You got plenty of time before seeds show up. But if it's in the middle of August and you know that it's gonna be flowering in a few weeks and producing seeds, you don't have time to use a grass specific herbicide that late in the season. So that can limit the use of this. Also, it requires an oil surfactant, some kind of methylated seed oil, bean oil, to allow it to be most effective on grass leaves. And that's kind of a hassle. They're more expensive. Uh, it's another thing to have to clean out of your applicator. And finally, every single 
grass specific herbicide ever re I've ever used has a really strong smell. It, it kind of volatilizes and it's not a pleasant smell. So those are reasons why this is not um, a, a perfect method. It, it has some downsides. If you are interested in a grass specific herbicide, it is sold as Clethodem 2EC at Rural King locally. Get the smallest bottle you can. That's usually the answer for everything. If you're a private landowner is get the smallest bottle because if, if you're using 0.5%, um, eight ounces of it is going to last you for years. So, um, and the final option, this is, this is one we've been testing out in MC Iris, something called phenoxaprop-PFL. This is a specialty turf grass chemical and it kills crabgrass, but it also happens to kill stilt grass. So we are finding more and more yards in Bloomington where if you look closely at your turf, it's sprinkled with stilt grass throughout. And then the stilt grass continues to spread into your garden beds, into your adjacent forest. And so people have been looking for a way to clear the stilt grass out of um, turf. And this seems to work really well. You can purchase it in quantity um, concentrated as a claim, that's a brand name for it, or you can buy it basically ready to use as bare advanced all-in-one lawn weed and crabgrass killer. Uh, it's basically the same chemical. Um, so that's for turf situations. So those are good options for larger infestations. But let's talk about really large dense infestations. This picture in the upper right is um, a landowner in Southeast Monroe County for whom I did an invasive survey last year. <clears throat> Excuse me. You see that path in the middle? Everything to either side is stilt grass. Nothing but stilt grass. It's pure. Everything else is gone. And I have to speak to the elephant in the room here <clears throat> before I go on about control, which is really the deer in the middle of the room. The reason that this is all stilt grass is not because stilt grass came in and bullied every single native plant out of there. The reason it's there is because the deer population is so far beyond carrying capacity in much of Monroe County that the deer are eating. Every tree seedling is gone. Every herbaceous plant is gone. Every shrub is gone other than pawpaw or spice bush, which are the only ones that deer won't eat. That's what ends up with a site like this. The deer eat those native plants and still grass simply comes in and takes over the bare ground. So unless you do something about deer situation, it's very hard to get um, good control over stilt grass. Because if you kill all of it, you're gonna have a big bare area and the stilt grass is gonna come back in because there are no native plants to actually cover that area and keep the stilt grass out. So it is a little bit more complicated than simply killing the stilt grass. So for very large dense infestations, um, more and more people are starting to use pre-emergence uh, in the early season before they start germinating to keep the seeds from germinating. And two chemicals that are being used for that are Barricade and Surflan. Those are the trade names. The uh, active ingredients are prodiamine and orizolin. And I've heard good things from people about those. Um, I have not used them myself. They are kind of a pain to use because they don't stay in um, uh, solution very well. You have to keep jiggling to keep the, the agitated, uh, the mix. Otherwise, they tend to settle out in the water. Um, but that's an option. Now, I've talked with some of my friends who are professional invasive controllers and, and one who I really trust suggested this option. And this is really kind of an advanced method um, that if you have never used herbicide before, don't start with this method. But if you have tried glyphosate on stilt grass and you feel like it wasn't working right for you because it just seemed to come back so much, one way to uh, 
be a little more successful is to combine glyphosate at a spectacularly low level, 0.125%, and aminopyrrolid, which is sold as milestone at 0.125%, again with surfactant. And what happens is the glyphosate will kill the stilt grouse with very little impact to other species because it's so dilute. And the aminopyrrolid will suppress seed germination of all species for several months, meaning that next spring, there will be a lot fewer seeds that germinate. And it helps you kind of get ahead of that seed bank issue. Now, huge caution, huge caution. And I, and I really thought about not including milestone. I don't recommend this if you are new to herbicides. Um, it is a chemical that stays active in the soil for a whole season. And even used at these very low rates, overspray can harm plants, uh, kill them dead. Um, it is selective in that it kills mostly composites, legumes, and buckwheat family members. So that's a good thing, but I'm gonna tell you a horror story about it in a little bit to, to explain why you need to use caution if you decide to use this. This is a new chemical, Dow created it about 10 to 15 years ago. And for the first several years, no one I knew used it because of the sticker shock. For professionals, you get two and a half gallon jugs of herbicide concentrated. That's how it's sold because you're using large quantities. A two and a half gallon jug of Milestone is $500. That's a lot. And so people were saying, I can't, I, that just seems like too much. And also if I'm using it at 0.125%, two and a half gallons will less, you know, last me until the next century. Fortunately, they've started selling quarts, uh, and that's $90 for a quart of it. Um, and for professionals who are using it, it has become um, a really valuable chemical. And it's gonna come up a couple more times in this talk. So I'm just uh, introducing it here. If you do decide to use it, read everything about it and use great caution. Now, what about mowing or weed whacking? This is a question we get a lot because you would like to think that if you could, you could just mow your way out of this, you know, if it's in a field, just mow that field. Well, if you do mow before the seeds are being produced, and that means you have to be mowing before the end of August, you can slow down the seed production because you'll be cutting off the flowering stems. They're gonna have to re-sprout and put out flowers again, and they will but it's gonna give you about a two week window where you can now spray and hopefully kill it before it puts out flowers. And while mowing will reduce the number of seeds to some extent, it will not stop seed production. And the reason why is in this picture. So these are the stems of stilt grass and coming, sticking out here is what they call a regular flower. Other name for that is a chasmogonous flower, a flower that is open to be pollinated, in this case, by the wind. But still grass is tricky. See down here, this little stem? It has flower inside there called a cleistogonous flower. Those flowers never open up, never get pollinated. They self-pollinate and they're right at ground level. So it doesn't matter how much you mow, those cleistogamous flowers are gonna set seed and they are gonna drop there. So you might reduce overall the number of seeds, you're not gonna get rid of seeds. And this is probably obvious, but once it is in seed, starting in September really, don't mow it. Because if you're mowing it, all those seeds are just getting flown around. Uh, you're getting seeds on your equipment. So if the equipment goes elsewhere, it's gonna transfer the stilt grass. So um, overall, it's not a, 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 not a something it's not something that is going to really get rid of stilt grass for you. Okay, now we're gonna talk about the two biennials. Don't have as much to say about them because they're fairly easy to kill. The timing is the issue. And I included poison hemlock and wild parsnip in the, in the midsummer marauders when I really should have put them in the spring of vicious villains, I think it was. Because while 
Poison hemlock and wild parsnip are very evident right now because they're huge and they're hanging with seed out there. We'll talk about that. Um, it's too late to control them in summer. They really have to be controlled in spring. Poison hemlock is a biennial, as we talked about, sometimes perennial, but really not in, in uh, Indiana. It can grow three to nine feet tall. I have seen them nine feet tall. They are just massive plants. It's from Eurasia, introduced in the 19th century, and it produces huge amounts of seed. That's what biennials do. Um, it is unbelievably toxic. Ingestion can be fatal. If you have a cut on your arm and you get sap from poison hemlock, you would be very, very, very sick. Um, it grows in moist, disturbed areas. The flowers shown in this left picture, this is in the um, carrot family, the Queen Anne's lace family. They all have umbels, which is like an umbrella where you have one stick and then you have all these little flowers coming out from that central point, that's an umbel. So all those umbels of white flowers are there. Um, fruits turn into dry fruits um, in those umbels. That's the stage we're at right now. If you see poison hemlock, they're starting to turn brown, all of the seed. The way you really identify poison hemlock, look at this ferny leaf. And this leaf is, can be up to 18 inches long. That is a big leaf. So this is a big plant. Um, for first year plants, um, that's what you'll see are the leaves just starting to develop later in the season. But it's really the second year plants that you're gonna see in the spring uh, with the big leaves and then sending up a flowering stalk that is green with purple spots. That is super uh, identifiable. Um, there's really nothing else that has a hollow green stalk no hairs on it with purple spots. There's a similar species called marsh or water hemlock, but it's a much smaller plant. The leaf is much less dissected, less ferny than the poison hemlock, and it tends to be in much wetter habitats. There's usually water standing where you see marsh hemlock. And let's talk about the second biennial before we talk about control, because control is the same for the two of them. Wild parsnip. This is also a biennial. It also has the umbel of flowers. This picture shows it real well. You've got this central stalk and then this umbrella of little flower clusters. Each of these are little umbels as well. It has yellow flowers instead of white, but otherwise it's really similar to poison hemlock. It's in bloom at the same time. You see it in the same habitat, which is often roadsides. You look up and down, whether it's I-69 or many of our county roads are covered with both the white poison hemlock and the yellow uh, pars wild parsnip, both in bloom at the same time. Uh, this is a patch of wild parsnip with lots and lots of plants, it has that yellow look because of all the flowers. And these are the leaves. Uh, they are pinnately compound. Um, and this really is parsnip. So if you grow parsnips in your garden, this is the second year plant of the edible parsnip. Um, these leaves should never come in contact with your skin because they cause severe blistering. I have had it twice. It is awful. Just big, huge blisters that eventually pop they leave a burgundy scar on your skin for over a year. It doesn't itch, but it's uh, photoactive. So if you go out in the sun and sun hits the blister, it feels like ants are crawling under your skin. It's a really awful feeling. So it's a good leaf to know how to identify and avoid. So let's talk about how do you control both of these? Safety first. Do not expose bare skin to poison hemlock or wild parsnip. Don't take chances with it. Now, if you have small plants, if you're out there in March, April, and you're looking for those leaves and you see them, they're pretty easy to pull up then because they are so small. It's a very small little taproot. As they start getting bigger in April and May, they can get harder to pull because it's a bigger plant. 
and you're having to deal with a lot more foliage and you know you don't want to get in there and do some sort of wrestling move to get it out and have it uh, hit you in the face or something like that. So a lot of time for biennials, people use a sharpened shovel. They sell something called the parsnip predator. That is this shovel right here. And it's got a, a very sharp edge that you slice down a couple of inches below the soil surface. You just have to slice through the taproot, move on to the next one. It's quick and it's relatively easy. I would say that I wouldn't wait as this gentleman in the picture has until it's already in fruit because then you're having to do this waltz move, waltzing with the flowering stem while doing that. Early is better. Try and control this in April and May uh, before it bolts and you have more foliage to deal with. By far, I think the easiest and safest method to control both of these plants is in April and May, spray the plants with 3% glyphosate and surfactant. Um, I did that this year. I was helping Sycamore Land Trust with one of their preserves where there was a patch, um, probably a thousand square feet that had been completely taken over by poison hemlock because it was next to the road. And these are all along our roads and it had moved into the preserve near a rare plant. So I went in in May, sprayed it with 3% glyphosate. Two weeks later, they were all dead. They're very easy to kill with uh, herbicide, with herbicide. So earlier is better. Um, once there are open flowers, and that's late May, early June, even if you cut that seed head down or cut the flower head down, even if you use a parsnip predator and cut through the root, those flowers can still produce seed. I tested this last year at, um, at another site and uh, went back and while the cut stems that were cut when they were in flower didn't produce as many seeds, there were still viable seeds enough to keep the population going. Um, but you can use the same technique we talked about with stiltgrass, mow the flowering plants down, this is before they're producing any seeds, and then this plant will have to re-sprout and put out new flowers. And that gives you a couple week window where you can go in and spray um, to actually kill the plants. So those are the biennials. Okay, just see. Yes. Okay. I was just checking the chat box, and yes, I can't see a way to change it so that you can chat with everyone. Sorry about that. Okay, so we're down to the perennials now, but before we get there, this is a quick commercial for our Reduce One Invasive Species Challenge. And it can be overwhelming. I'm just talking about six tonight, but it's still like, oh my gosh, there's so many out there to deal with. We like to focus on one. Last year, we focused on Asian bush honeysuckle. This year, MC Iris is focusing on purple winter creeper um, and asking people to really learn about it, look for it, and control it where you can. And if you do that, we will give you free native gown covers. We have an application form on our website. Uh, it's on the home page is the link for this program. Sign up and we will have six different native ground covers for you to take your choice of. Uh, we're gonna be giving these away to those who apply on September 11th at Switchyard Park. The truly exciting news is that we're going to also have a native plant sale going on. So not only will we be giving out free plants just to those who were part of this challenge, We'll also be selling a wide variety of native plants on September 11th at Switchyard Park. Uh, there's an event up uh, already on the MC Iris uh, Facebook page. Uh, the details are there. And um, certainly get yourself on the MC Iris email list. You can do that on our uh, website so that you can hear more about when that's gonna be uh, the details of our September 11th plant sale. Okay, now we gotta talk about three of the worst invasive plants in the world. They are some of the hardest to control. And so uh, it's, it's a real challenge to talk about them because everybody's got a, um, 
a story about them and how it didn't work, <laughs> the control that they tried. Um, can thistle is perhaps the worst. And, it, and it's one where there's been so much research because this is a huge agricultural weed. Most of our invasive plants that we're talking about tonight aren't huge agricultural problems. This one is. Um, it is a widespread perennial herb growing up to six and a half feet tall. Um, it's native to uh, Eurasia, not Canada, despite the name. <laughs> it's not native to North America. It was introduced in the 1600s, I'm sure by mistake, because these, these little seeds uh, get everywhere. Um, it spreads by lateral roots uh, that sp spread horizontally 10 to 12 feet per year. It can regenerate from root fragments. Um, it is widespread throughout the state. Um, it flowers, spring, and especially if it gets mowed, sometimes it'll put up late flowers as well, but it starts its flowering in the spring. Um, the bracts have little spine tips. Bracts are these little structures that are clasping the flower head, and each one has a little spine tip on it. And then when the flower is done, it puts up uh, this, this fluffy seed head that the wind then disperses. The leaves are sessile and alternate on the stem uh, with spine tipped leaves. The stem has no spines, which kind of distinguishes it from a lot of the other uh, thistles. Um, and the high, higher up on the stem generally grooved, so not just plain round, you see ridges and grooves in it. There are similar species. Uh, native swamp thistle is listed here. Um, that one's more uh, common in the north part of the state, but we also have tall thistle and we have pasture thistle here in Monroe County that are native. And um, the no spines on the stem is one way to tell that it's Canada thistle, whether where there's spines on the stem, it's uh, native. A another one is uh, Canada thistle is the only rhizomatous thistle I know. So if you just have widely scattered plants, um, that is probably not Canada thistle. Canada thistle tends to grow in patches where rhizomes are putting up many, many sprouts all in one area. Also the timing. Usually the non-native thistles are early bloomers. Our native thistles don't bloom until next month. Late this month, early next month. So um, that's another way to distinguish. Okay, so how to control it. First thing to note is unusually Canada thistle is a noxious weed in Indiana. Most of the invasive plants we deal with are not. And being a noxious weed, it means that landowners have a proactive responsibility to control it on their land. But it is widely recognized that it is almost impossible to control without chemicals because of the rhizomes that Canada thistle has. They continue to put up new sprouts no matter how long you pull the shoots. And this picture on the right is one I found online. This was an area that they planted with 25 little stalks of Canada thistle, just like one year plants. And they let it grow for a year. And after that year, they used high pressure water to get rid of the dirt and leave the roots. And there's the root system in one year. And it, it helps you understand why it can be difficult for an herbicide to kill this plant because there's always a part of the root system that survives because the herbicide doesn't get throughout the entire plant. So some chemical options to consider. Um, all of these, the best time to apply herbicide to Canada thistle is during the flower bud to early flowering stage. We're already past that or to the green rosettes in the fall of the year. Those are the two best times when you're gonna have the best success. You can use 2% glyphosate <clears throat> or Roundup. This will likely take many repeated treatments because of that rhizome system. 
There is a chemical called clopyrrolid, sold as transline. It used to be sold as stinger. Now it's, it's largely transline. This can be more effective because it stays active in the soil for the whole season. Um, this was a forerunner, clopyrrolid was, to the aminopyrrolid we already talked about, sold as milestone. Um, aminopyrrolid was like a further, they took clopyrrolid, they further studied it, and they came up with this more, even more specialized chemical called aminopyrrolid. So there's a lot of similarities between the two. Both of them are specific to legumes, composites, and buckwheat family members. Um, Again, this is sort of the advanced options. The calendar of control is really the basic 101 methods for beginners. I'm giving you some sort of advanced information here. You should take um, and do your due diligence on whether this is a method you want to use. So let me give you my horror story. I was managing a garden and it had Canada thistle popping up in the garden bed. And I did the same thing everyone does. I pulled every one of those darn shoots twice, three times, four times, and they kept coming up from that massive rhizome system. And I had milestone. So I said, all right, I am going to very carefully wipe. I'm not even gonna spray because I don't wanna get this anywhere else in the garden. I'm gonna wipe uh, with a sponge the leaves of the Canada thistle plant so that it will translocate the milestone into that whole root system and kill it. And it did. What I hadn't factored into this was that that Canada thistle in that garden bed had a red bud tree in it. And the Canada thistle was within five feet of the red bud. A red bud is a legume and milestone will kill legumes. And that red bud dropped its leaves. I was fortunate it came back. And this was a good sized red bud, like probably three inch caliper DBH, 15 feet tall. Um, and fortunately it came back after the shock, but it gave me a, a really um, good example of you really have to be careful with that chemical and recognize that any legumes, composites, or buckwheat family within that area may die. So this is, again, a more advanced treatment. Our second of the three perennials is crown vetch. And I'm gonna take a brief little break here and just say, you may have noticed that I've been putting up screens that have the same format, this little name in the um, uh, purple or different color and pictures and so on. What this is, is I'll hold up here the Guide to Regulated Terrestrial Invasive Plant Species of Indiana. And there is a free PDF of all this information on the mc-iris.org website if you want to download it. If you want to buy a copy on waterproof paper, they're $10 and we're very happy. We're partnering with Purdue Extension. Amy's office is um, helping with distribution so that we can sell them and you can pick them up at the Extension office. So the website tells how to do that transaction. So if you're interested in that information, um, that's where you can find it. Okay, crowned vetch. So this is an event, I'm guessing you all know crown vetch. This is one that you see along every roadside because it was heavily planted along roadsides. It is a legume. Um, it has uh, flowers. It's uh, finishing up its flowering right now in our area. Uh, the flowers are pink and white and it's an umble that has 10 to 25 flowers. Lots of small flowers in a cluster on each one. This is what it looks like when you have a big batch of it in bloom. These are the leaves. It is the typical uh, pinnately compound uh, leaf of a legume. The stems are hairless. Importantly, nowhere on this plant are there any tendrils. And that's how you can tell it from any of our native vetches, um, which are in the Vicia uh, genus. They all have tendrils and they tend to have either single flowers 
or just a few flowers in a long straight raceme, not a little cluster like crown vetch. This is going to look real similar to thistle. It's almost to control, impossible to control without chemicals because it also has an extensive rhizome system and they'll continue to put up new sprouts no matter how long you pull shoots. Your options for chemicals are 3% glyphosate. It is best to time it so that you spray it before it flowers. So that's like April, May, or you then wait until late summer. For these tough species, timing really matters. So there's no point in wasting herbicide in the middle of summer because you're just not going to get a very good response. Or you can do one of the two chemicals we talked about earlier, the clopyrrolid or the aminopyrrolid. And again, the same cautions uh, apply. Because crown vetch is a legume, it is particularly susceptible to both of those uh, chemicals, just like Canada thistle, because it is a composite, is particularly susceptible to clopyrrolid and aminopyrrolid. Oh, and our final species, or multiple species, because there's actually three species, giant knotweed, Japanese knotweed, and the hybrid between the two, which is called bohemian knotweed. Um, a botanist, Scott Namasnik, who's looked at closely at a lot of the knotweeds, certainly in the northern part of the state, believes that really what we've got in Indiana is largely bohemian knotweed. It doesn't matter. They all act the same. They're all eight to 10 foot tall herbaceous perennials that have bamboo-like stems. They're from Eastern Asia. They were brought here as ornamentals um, because they've got these long stems, eight to 10 feet, and then these white frothy flowers in the middle of summer. So it's kind of, you can see it as a hedge plant. Um, you can see it around Bloomington. Some people are using it as a hedge planting. Um, the flowers are uh, small five petaled uh, cream colored flowers that then turn into uh, little fruits that are akines and they have wings on them to help disperse. When these first come out in the spring, they look really odd because they come out absolutely bright red. This is a Japanese knotweed leaf that once it emerges and starts to grow, it slowly turns green. Um, this shows the difference between the leaf shape of the Japanese bohemian giant knotweed. Again, I don't think it really matters. They're similar enough in look and in behavior that we can just call them the knotweeds, the invasive knotweeds. But once again, it's going to look similar. Um, knotweed is in the Polygonaceae, which is closely related to the buckwheat family, or it is the buckwheat family. It is the buckwheat family. So this is the third family that Milestone and, uh, is effective on. Um, so I will say, I know people who have struggled with um, Japanese knotweed. There are, I have seen discussions where mulching or covering it with a tarp for at least two years will reduce the population and will keep it from spreading but they do note that it won't actually kill it. It'll just keep it from spreading. Once you take that tarp off, it's going to go again. Or if you can mow it to the ground six or more times a year for multiple years, it can be controlled. And that's a crazy amount of work, but for some people, the knotweed is in their yard. And so if they can change their mowing pattern, so they just start mowing it as often as they mow it their grass, you can get fairly good control. It just has to keep continuing and you know, when you get down to the point where you have just a few left, just go ahead and dig them out to get rid of it completely. But if you can't do all of that manual work to get rid of it, the chemical options can include milestone, as I said, um, but they always recommend cutting knotweed a couple times before you do anything with chemicals. You wait in the spring until it's three feet tall. Right now, Japanese knotweed is already six feet tall in Bloomington. So it's way beyond that point. 
It's about in May that it's three feet tall. And at that point, cut it to the ground. Let it come up again. Let it bloom. It should start flowering in the next three, four weeks. When it starts flowering, boom, cut it again down to the ground. And then let it re-sprout. And when it's three feet tall, late in the season, that's when you start with the chemical. Okay, two cuts, then the chemical. You're probably getting an idea how hard this one is to kill. Um, aminopyrrolid works great. The problem is that Milestone has no water safe um, form. So you can't use it near water. And a lot of times, not always, Japanese knotweed is found along creeks or where there is water. It likes moisture. If it's in your yard and there's no water around, sure, then you can use Milestone. But if there is water, what's recommended on the calendar of control is imazapyr is the chemical, habitat is what it's sold as, that's a water safe version. Use 1% of the habitat plus a half percent of the glyphosate. You're still gonna do that, cut it twice and spray in the fall. That's when you would spray the habitat. This one, like Milestone, it stays active in the soil. So it, um, and, and I think this one can stay active for like a year. Um, that's what makes it so effective on Japanese knotweed, being able to get to all of the rhizomes of this plant. But that also means that it's a much stronger chemical that can have much more negative impacts if it's used improperly. So those are options for Japanese knotweed. Ellen? Okay. Well, yeah, go ahead. Um, I have a neighbor who has Japanese knotweed, but in a very, very shady yard. And um, I was just looking at it today and the, um, a, a year ago, we cut it at the wrong time and, and just treated the cuts with Roundup. But I was looking at the, the uh, knotweed just today and it's because I guess because it's in such a shady yard, it's there are plants that are just 12 inches tall. I think that I know two feet tall. There's not really, they're not flowering and they're not getting that tall. So can I still just go ahead and cut it um, in August, September or whatever and cut it uh, partway and treat the stems with this amazapyr and glyphosate mixture or since I can't really do yeah, it. No. If you've got a variety of sizes and yeah, it, it definitely grows slower in the shade. And even the one, the, you know, the one cut that you did last year with the stem treatment may have helped to keep the plants smaller than, you know, a healthy population would be. Um, you can use 50% um, glyphosate on the cut stem if, if you like. And you can do that two or three times in a year. If you wanted to do the cut stem approach now and then do it again in the fall, you would be even more effective. Or you okay. could just cut it a couple of times and then use the glyphosate. I didn't include glyphosate because it, it usually takes a lot of retreatments. Uh -huh. um, and for most people, if you're dealing with Japanese knotweed and there's you know, a couple hundred stems, and that's not uncommon. There can be hundreds of stems, even in a small patch, because they're so dense. It is really tedious to cut all of those and then try and dab every single one of those hundreds of stems. Right. So um, it does, the advantage of course, which may be why you used it, is you have less chance of overspray less chance of impact to other plants or to the turf. So that's a plus. It's just that it may take way more treatments. Okay, so, so do you think it would be better just to go ahead and spray the small plants this fall with the amazapyr? And... Is, it, is it surrounded by turf? Well, uh, part of it, this gentleman had is somebody just Bobcat's backyard, which was a so there's really nothing there that's 
hardly, I mean, there are some trees, uh, you know, there are big trees in there, but he, he sort of just tore up the rest of the yard. There, there has some that has spread under the fence though, and is in near a garden with sensitive ferns and uh, uh, some other native plants, you know, like, so it's like two different areas that I was gonna work on for him. Yeah. So would this, would any, any of these herbicides hurt the big trees too? If we sprayed, if they're close to a tree, if if like you a maple use, tree or um, oak trees and white oaks, maple and oak, from my experience, ought to be okay with milestone. Um, but if it's a legume tree, if it's black right. locust, okay, you harm it. And you might want to use two different methods for the two different situations you've got. Uh, where there's nothing that could be impacted, you know, it's already bare, you might want to use a foliar spray. Where you've got it around a garden where you don't want other things to be harmed, you could do a cut and paint with 50% glyphosate. And, okay. Um, and I can do the cut stem like three times a year, even if I, it's going to require lots of, lots of time. So. If you're using glyphosate, because that's a chemical that deactivates fairly quickly, it doesn't last in the soil. Um, mm. And so uh, you, you could do that three times in the year and be fine. Could I use the imazapyr mixed with the glyphosate on the cut stem treatment? Would that be smarter? No? No, because um, that, that's intended to be a foliar. Okay. It's a very dilute solution. To, be, to do any sort of stem treatment takes a concentrated, a more concentrated herbicide, a 50% solution of glyphosate. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, that was, you bet, you're welcome. That was six species. Uh, I just want to point out here uh, at the end that we do uh, give out lots of practical experience through our workday. Uh, and this Saturday, in fact, we have one of our first Saturday weed wrangles. It's the second Saturday of July, but because of the 4th of July, we're doing a second Saturday in here. And we're going to be doing it at Griffey Lake, pulling Japanese stilt grass, probably some other things. This is through a partnership with uh, the wonderful city of Bloomington Parks and Recreation. Um, and so we're always excited to go out with them. It's a chance to learn about the beautiful city parks we've got. We get a nice uh, walk and so see different parts of parks and then we teach you how to do the control and talk about invasive species and work together as a group. It's a lot of fun and this one at, at Griffey uh, is always one of my favorites because I just think it's a beautiful place to work. So there's a link for registration through the um, uh, parks volunteer uh, site. We also, MC Iris does uh, a variety of, of other types of weed wrangles. Uh, I know Jillian uh, Field is on the call and she's coordinated a whole bunch of um, garlic mustard pulls this spring um, at Pate Hollow Trail and um, the Dean Wilderness Hayes Trail. And now we're gearing up for Japanese silk grass pulls where there's just little bits of Japanese silk grass uh, on these trails and we can uh, make a huge impact by hiking these beautiful places and pulling. And there's a sign up for that uh, as well. And all of this is on our website. If you can't get these URLs down, just go to mc-iris.org and a uh, calendar of events and the links are there. And of course we have a Facebook site where we regularly um, promote what we're doing and how you can get involved. And with that, that is all of my prepared content. Um, and so let me go through and if anybody asks questions in the chat, I can see if um, not a, um, Barbara points out in Vigo County, she really, really hates stilt grass, but she's making some inroads. So good for you, Barbara, it takes time. Mary is asking, is the seed from the Bohemian hybrid not weed viable? And that's an excellent question because many of you know that if you have two different species and they hybridize, they might not produce viable seed. I don't know if that's the case uh, with Bohemian. I have, people have said that it seems like generally 
not much of the seed is viable. And I don't know if that's because it's the hybrid or what. So I don't have a good answer for you, Mary. And so Thanks. since the chat <laughs> isn't working, you're welcome. Um, I'm just gonna open it up, stop sharing so I can see all of your beautiful faces. There you are. And um, just go ahead and take yourself off mute, anybody who wants to ask a question. Are there species that I didn't talk about that are plaguing you right now? Well, I'm also working on, I started last year on Pseudochorus iris in a marsh and um, I'm using rodeo, a water glyphosate, water safe glyphosate. And I was just cutting and treating stems all all last spring and into the fall and in, in the fall. Cause I read you're supposed to do it before it flowers but it's mostly in a shady marsh woods so it doesn't flower. So I was just kind of guessing when other irises bloomed and, and then one website in another state said that fall, you could also do it in the fall but it's harder to time when that's appropriate. But most of it did, did not return. I still have maybe 10% that I need to work on. And so how can, do you have any idea how you know when to do that in the fall or, and I read one state's website said to mix it 30% 30, 30 glyphosate with 70% uh, water. Is that what you think too? Well, um, first in terms of the mixing, one way that things can get really confusing really fast is if people are saying, a volume to volume mix, which is what I've been referring to all along, a 50% volume to volume, meaning half water, half concentrated herbicide versus active ingredient dilution. If you do that, that's 20% because the full strength is about 40%, say. So if you cut it in half, you've got a 20% active ingredient. So the numbers can get really confusing if you don't define what kind of dilution you're talking about. Um, if that was volume to volume, 30% is probably adequate. Um, a lot of people just as a rule for stem treatment, I usually just use 50% because okay. you're using a minute amount of really targeted herbicide. So I'm pretty comfortable using the stronger version. In terms of the timing, um, I don't know of a specific time period when it, you would be more affected with stem treatment for the yellow flag iris, the invasive iris. Um, I would think mostly September, October until first frost would be very effective timing. Okay. And I'm really interested that you did a cut stem treatment on that because we were there's another Facebook group called the Indiana Invasive Plant Advisory Committee. And we there share information on how to control. And someone was just asking, how do you kill Iris Pseudoacorus? Because they had tried a foliar treatment and it was not effective. And they were looking for, you know, what should we do? Is there a better chemical? Um, and you know, the leaves of that iris just repel liquid. So mm -hmm. it's really hard to get things to stick. It may be that stem treatment, though I'm sure it takes a long time to do, it was is, is yeah. more effective. Yes, and I did read one state said that if it's an area that uh, floods with very deep water, if it can, if it stays, if you can flood the area and keep cut it and then keep it underwater for a long enough time, it, but that's not, this marsh woods floods and then where ducks can it swim and then, it's, then it comes down. So I, I couldn't really do that. So and I did have, yeah. a, I had a gentleman from Bloomington that had tried to spray a tiny bit for me and it just didn't even phase it uh, several, about three years ago. So that's why I just tried the cut stem treatment and it seems to have worked. The, I have a much, much smaller patch and I had a huge patch. So that is really good to hear. That's yeah, very I, interesting. I used rodeo and then just that uh, herbicide blue dye so I could see where I, was the problem is those rhizomes, um, like I could I could cut and the, treat the stem, but then the it was almost better in the fall when the water was down a little bit because the rhizome sends up n new little shoots along the rhizome, and you may they may only be an inch tall where some of the leaves are 
three or four feet tall. Um, so you think you've cut and treated all the little leaves, but then you notice in the fall, you really haven't. So you have to go back and further down the rhizome. But I pulled out, I don't know if this is necessary, but the gentleman from Bloomington, I got his name off of the Indiana Native Plant Society website. He said, I, it's also good just to get all that dead plant matter out of there so it doesn't hurt the oxygenation of the water as it's decomposing. And hmm. even though I said I did notice I had a spring in there, so that was good. But as far as hurting the aquatic life, and so I tried to yep. bag up the dead plant matter too. That's great. Are you in Monroe County, Patricia? No, I'm in Vigo County. With okay. Uh huh. Very cool. That sounds like a great project. I'm really interested to hear that you think you've been getting some good success with the cut stem treatment. I'll, I'll remember that for others who are struggling. Yeah, I can send you some photos of before and after so far. It's uh, It really has worked really well. That's great. Yeah, I'd love to see the pictures. Thank you. Other questions from people? I was just gonna say, bittersweet has me down and oh. I thought, it might be good to even talk a little bit about that because the window of treatment, since it is limited, since it does lose its leaves fairly early in the in the growing season. That is a great point. Um, thank you, Mary. Um, Oriental bittersweet is a tough one. Um, it is a woody vine with deciduous leaves. And like Mary says, those deciduous leaves drop at the same time as uh, all of the uh, all of the natives do so it's not like it stays green longer and you can attack it without harming other things um, if you're fortunate you have a big vine and you can simply cut that vine and treat that stump with a 50 percent glyphosate uh, and declare victory but unfortunately it often is lots of tangled smaller vines and like baby vines throughout the forest floor. It, it does fairly well in, in shady habitats. Um, and so I know that one of the places that is worst infested in Indiana is the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore and they have been do doing studies for years on how to effectively control it. It hasn't been a rousing success it, it's just very hard. They tried using fire um, as part of the management and fire did not help at all and actually kind of made it worse because they just got more re-sprouts. Um, and uh, it, it's very hard to control using a foliar spray on smaller ones because they're on top of all the native plants. And so when you kill the oriental bittersweet, you very much risk killing the native plants that are underneath. Um, so honestly, it's a tough one. And I don't, I don't have any great tips for how to deal with it, other than if you have a big vine, cut that and paint the surface with 50% glyphosate. I will say that many of the smaller ones that you find in the woods, they have relatively shallow roots and a fair number of them can be pulled. You'll notice when you pull Oriental Bittersweet, the roots are bright orange. It's very noticeable and hang them up in the trees. So that's one way to reduce them easily without using herbicide and having overspray onto valued natives. But I'd welcome any other thoughts. Mary, do you have any suggestions or from what you've seen out in the field? By the way, I didn't introduce Mary, but for those of you who don't know her, Mary Wells uh, works for the Indiana Invasives Initiative and is our regional invasive specialist for this part of the state. Um, so <laughs> she works with MC Iris a lot um, and we're very thankful for that, to have her knowledge. Um. Other than just using triclopyr during this time of year with a good a normal amount of surfactant for the, if you have like an understory infestation, that's all I've got. <laughs> Is triclopyr better than glyphosate? From my understanding of it, um, yes. But you could probably use both because it you don't need a ton of surfactant to get through that leaf. But I also like it because you're not using 
hurting your sedges and your native woodland grasses. So at least you've got some vegetation left over. Good point, because dry clover is one of those specialized chemicals that only kills the broadleaf plant like the oriental bittersweet and won't kill your sedges, won't kill your grasses. So you can be a little bit more specific in your spraying. Good point. All right, any other questions? Does American bittersweet also have orange roots from Amy? Boy, that's a good question because I have never ripped up an American bittersweet <laughs> to check because they're so unusual at this point. Um, I am actually growing one, but I'm not going to rip it up to look what its roots are. <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> I don't know if anybody has ever ripped up a, an American bittersweet. Uh, let me know. My guess is they they might be orange as well. So I don't think it's a distinguishing factor between the two species. And for those of you know. American and Oriental bittersweet can be very difficult to distinguish, especially if they're not in fruit. If they are in fruit, American bittersweet, all the fruits are held at the terminal end of the uh, stem. Oriental bittersweet, the berries are held in the axles of leaves all up and down the stem, lots of axillary fruits. So I'm not sure that root color is going to help distinguish and it's kind of a um, uh, not a great way to idea plant is to rip it out of the ground and then because it's, it's dead then. <laughs> All right. Um, Mine was um, only tangentially related. I was trying to organize a um, purple winter creeper uh, thing with my Girl Scout troop and I was wondering if I could arrange to like talk to you about that sometime. Hold on a second, I'm sorry. Um, to talk <laughs> about that and have a plan of approach. I'm sorry, I'm fostering puppies right now, so it's a little loud, but um, I could send you my email if that would be helpful. Absolutely, absolutely. We can talk about that. Um, I'm sure that we've got advice that we can give about ways to go about that. I don't know if you remember, there was, um, oh boy, now it's four or five years ago, there was a school, the Orchard School in Indianapolis that had the fourth grade class take on purple winter creeper, did a whole uh, project removing it from the woods at Orchard School. And then they went and they met with the legislature to try and get them to make purple winter creeper illegal, which actually really helped us when we were doing the law that actually has banned it now. So um, teaching kids about this stuff can have great impacts. Oh, wow, that would be great. Well, I'll just um, put my email in the chat. Okay. Thank you so much. You bet. All right. Um, I think that's all I'm seeing. Anybody else want to talk about their, oh wait, here's from Nicole. Are the knotweeds you discussed the same as Persicaria polymorpha? I asked because I went to the Lurie Garden in Chicago last weekend and it was everywhere. And I am, I have no idea what, so I'm now doing Google is my friend and looking up polymorpha. It shouldn't be the same. That's not a synonym for any of the Japanese knotweeds. Oh, isn't that interesting? It's a shrubby clump forming perennial featuring plumes of creamy white flowers reminiscent of goat's beard from China. Well, it's, it's in the same ballpark, but it's, um, it, it's not closely related. It's not same genus at this point because um, the, the true knotweeds are in Raynutria as a, as a genus, um, so they're not Persicarias. But I, I do tend to look askance at um, a Chinese Persicaria, because we also have, um, that is closely related to Persicaria longaceta, Asian smartweed, which is that smartweed that has taken over all of our gardens and um, waste places in Monroe County and really Indiana at this point. So that's a persicaria as well. They can spread very fast. So I, it's not one I would use in landscaping. Um, I think, okay. My neighbor thinks her rattlesnake master is out competing her Canada thistle, Jillian says. We are going to watch this and document. Okay, that would be fascinating if Rattlesnake Master was 
dense enough to keep Canada thistle from coming up. So keep an eye on it, let me know. It may also be really good at hiding Canada thistle that's kind of <laughs> hiding under there, but watch it and see. I mean, that's, I think that's gonna be a, a huge new field of research for people is how do we use native plants to try and keep down invasive plants? The, the really aggressive natives that some of us might call weeds, sometimes that's exactly what you need to keep the real invasives from coming in and taking hold. And especially if the deer won't eat them. That's what we need uh, in an area where we have too many deer eating all the native plants and allowing the invasives to come in. Well, is it true that uh, Canada ginger can choke out garlic mustard? I read that somewhere along those lines of what you're talking about. Have you ever heard that? Um, wild ginger can certainly grow densely on a forest floor and it's not a favored plant of deer because it kind of has a strong taste, but they will still eat it. If you had a really dense area of wild ginger, it potentially could keep down garlic mustard. Just that a lot of, it doesn't seem to grow that densely over large areas that it would be an effective control. But perhaps combined with black snake root and white snake root and um, appendaged water leaf and some of these things that are in there early and grow fast in the spring, right when garlic mustard is trying to get established, if you had enough of that, that could form enough of a armor to keep out or at least keep down the garlic mustard. Okay. Um, would you mind giving me a quick overview of Lespedeza? I would love to. <laughs> Lespedeza. So uh, we have a bunch of very cool native Lespedezas, wand Lespedeza, violet Lespedeza, and then we have some Asian Lespedezas that are invasive. The primary one that most people struggle with is called Cerecia Lespedeza, S-E-R-I-C-E-A, Cerecia. They'll just call it that. It's awful. It's been named a noxious weed in many places in the country. We haven't named it that, but especially as you go west, it has destroyed thousands of acres of rangeland because it's not palatable late in the season. And so you've got these huge ranges that Lespedia, Cerecia invaded. And so they've got like emergency areas in Kansas um, that they're trying to deal with because of the invasion of that species. In Indiana, um, it was planted very heavily in Southern Indiana on coal mine lands because it was one of the few things that would grow and then it spread from there. And um, people also put it into seed mixes for uh, uh, fields like old fields because they thought Cerecia lespedeza would be good for upland birds because it produces little fruits that are about the right size. But again, it, because it expands so dramatically and excludes other species, it has turned out not to be a good idea. It's a very tough one to kill. The primary chemical that people use is triclopyr. Um, it's much more effective on Cerecia than glyphosate is. Um, that said, it's still not perfect. What people are now doing is using triclopyr with 0.125% of milestone. And because it's a legume, the milestone can really finish it off. That's what I've been using on, on my property and it's, I'm still working on it, but I seem to be getting ahead of it now. So I'm not sure, Yvonne, if that answered the qu specific questions you had, but um, let me know if there was a different, uh, different Lespedeza you were talking about. No, I just, I last summer was just digging it up by hand, sitting for hours and hours in my yard, but I've noticed it just spreading everywhere. Like even in the parks, I find it. And so I was just curious. I know it doesn't seem to be taking over any woods or anything, but I just didn't know that much about it. How tall is the stuff that you're pulling? Well, I mean, I pull it, I mean, it, it stays in the grass, right? So I kind of like, I just, I just feel it down to its roots and pull that long root up, which is very satisfying, but you can spend like, 
weeks and weeks, hours and hours. <laughs> and it's, it's here again this year. So I don't think it made a dent at all, all the work that I did last year. I think the one you're talking about is not the Ceresia, which is okay. a plant that tends to be in old fields. I think you're talking about Korean Lespedeza. And Korean Lespedeza gets like maybe this tall and it has little three foliate, trifoliate leaves and it has tiny little purple flowers like in yes. August. Right. And I've got that too. It is miserable. It, and it's mostly, it's a lawn weed though I've seen it invading glades and barrens in Southern Indiana and in nice natural areas because it's an annual plant. Um, so where I've gotten ahead of it, I've used a spray. Um, like if it's around turf or with other stuff, I just overspray it with triclopyr and triclopyr kills the broad leaves, which is the Korean Lespedeza, and it doesn't kill the um, grass or um, sedges that might be there. So it's not a perfect method, but pulling it up is pretty tedious. I've done some of that in areas too, in my garden beds where I just wanna fine tune, get it out of there. Um, it's yeah, not a lot of people talk about Korean Lespedeza, but I think it is a real pain. Um, and it's actually, we call it Korean Lespedeza. It got put into a different genus. That genus is now Coomeroia. So it's Coomeroia stipulata, I think. And um, yeah, I, I haven't really investigated that one that much about if there's a better chemical way. So, so far, all I've used is triclopyr and I've been pretty happy with that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Well, that's all the questions that I see. Uh, feel free, uh, anyone, to jump in and um, any last thoughts or questions. And otherwise, I'll wrap this up. And I'll thank you for joining me and having this good discussion. And um, we will be having our fall invasives talk um, later this year. I don't have the exact date handy, but sometime this fall, we'll be doing our final one in this uh, series and talking about those species that it's best to control in the fall. So thank you all for joining me and have a good night. Bye. Good night. Good night.